Mm. Let's get still before God. Man. Something may work. All right. Let's get still before God, man. Let's go to work for our Lord's prayer. Father, we gather in your house this day to worship you. That's why we're here. God, we praise you, Lord, for your promises, for your love, and for your perfect, perfectly preserved word. You know every heart here. You know everything, God, that uh, we may be dealing with as individuals, different struggles, things that are bearing heavy upon our heart, upon our mind. God, I just pray right now, Lord, dear God, that we would yield all of these to you. And God, that we would listen with a spiritual ear. To hear, God, what you have for us. It's not about me, God. It's about your word. Father, I pray right now, Lord, that it's already been saved. We pray, Lord, you move upon every heart. If there be one here today that's lost, dear God, I pray, Lord, that you reveal that to them through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, two or three things before we get into the Word this morning. Um, just quickly uh, about the fellowship next Sunday night. Uh, we are going to try to have uh, homemade ice cream, so that means you've got to have homemade ice cream makers. And uh, so we figured all that out. If we don't have it, we won't have it, but we're going to have ice cream in some way. Even if, even if I had to put Johnny, Johnny Johnson over with a, with a with a with a can rolling it back and forth in ice, we're going to have homemade ice cream. Amen. Um, other thing, Caleb will be uh, speaking tonight. And uh, again, recently we've gone to Honduras, and he's going to give us a report on that, and and, uh, and, and, and then talk about the way things are, are done, particularly in foreign lands, as, as it relates to missions and the word. And then thirdly, um, this is uh, one something for for hopefully soon. Um, I am trying to to, to get information checked, double checked, documented before I present things to you, but there have been a, there have been over the years, this hasn't started, but there's a number of disturbing things that are taking place in the Southern Baptist Convention. Amen. And we as a church, okay, we need we need to take a look at this, okay? And so that's all I'm going to say about that right now. We'll discuss that later. Open your Bible to the book of Jude. Book of Jude. I've got two notebooks this morning. And uh, oh, oh, it's right. And um, so, anyway, sometimes I take notes, sometimes things at that time I write things out, and, and then I look up and I say, well, no, no, you got it in two different places. What are you going to do? Well, you just bring them up. Well, that's what I'm doing. I am going to do something today that I don't normally do, shall we say, as I'm um, teaching, um, preaching through um, a passage of Scripture. And I don't often give something a title, but I am today because of how this fits in and how this affects you, how this affects me, and how this affects us as a church. And so I'm going to give this a title of what's it all about or why is this so important, and then we'll come back to that toward the conclusion of this morning's message. Now, just because I say conclusion this morning's message doesn't mean when we get back to it that it's time to start putting your books up. That just means we're kind of in the ballpark. Does everybody understand that? But in the book of Jude, I need to take a running start at this and, and try my best not to get hung up as I go. But we're going to start at the, at the very beginning. At least I'll start in verse 3. How about let's do that? And then we're going to go all the way through verse 11. So the Jude here writes, he said, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful, or I was compelled by divine pressure, is what that means, needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith. 
Now the you here is we need to understand who it is. That's me. That's you. And that's every God established church. Okay, that's who that means. Which was once delivered means once for all unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Y'all understand they're already judged? Yes. Okay, that's what they're saying here. I'm afraid. Then it goes on to say ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Licentiousness. This is a this is a a a, a perverted greed. Verse 5 says, I will therefore put you in remembrance or remind you, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. One. Verse 6, number 2 says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, and I wish we had two, it would take two to three hours, literally, to go through just verse number 6. We've gone into this in great, great detail as we've talked through the book of Genesis. Um, Genesis, uh, going all the way back to Genesis 6, 7. This is the reason for the flood, primarily, or part of it, shall we say. But we don't have time to go there now. Their first estate, heaven. But left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Seven. Example number three says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, are just like these, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal life. So we're talking here about a group of individuals. We are not talking about, that we, and we, we've used this term, and this is what this is describing, we're talking about false teachers, but we're talking about those that the Bible describes as apostate. Here God has given three different examples here of those that have left the truth. Now understand this, what that means. <laughs> Leaving the truth means rejecting it. Right. Did I ever just say it? And in our minds, it's just, let's just say that intellectually, we look at some of this stuff, and let's just take Israel, the nation of Israel, way back yonder, and again, still suffering the effects from this, okay? But we still love them, and we still command and pray for them, amen? Because <laughs> God is going to change that situation during the tribulation period, the latter part. Now listen to me closely. We are not talking about those that lost their salvation. Does everybody understand that? Because you can't lose your salvation. But what we are talking about, those that knew the truth, here we are, we have the nation of Israel that, that, that's going with God. We're going through this on Wednesday nights, by the way. You need to be here. We're talking about those that are with God. God's leading them through the wilderness. We just got to the point in, in the Old Testament where the, the tabernacle has been built and all this and other. Moses has been up on the mountain. God has written with his own finger in stone. He's written the Ten Commandments. Moses comes down, and they're having an immoral party, and that's all as far as I'm going to go. And so God certainly disciplines them. Over 3,000 were killed there at that point. More to come and many more to come. But the bottom line is this. In our minds, intellectually, we look at things and we say, how in this world? Yeah. They knew what to do. God had told them this. God had told them that. And then they turn around and do the exact opposite and say, I don't want no part of that. And we try to look at this and figure this thing out with our minds. But we need to understand, these are things that are spiritually learned. Yes. Amen. One of the greatest examples in all of Scripture was Judas. Y'all yeah. remember Judas? Remember the old famous kiss? Yeah. You remember G Judas was there for some three, three plus years with Jesus Christ? Yeah. And he went about the countryside and he saw all that, that Jesus did. More importantly, heard, he heard the things that he taught. And he had, was there literally with the Son of God himself. With God himself. And that, my friends, is why the teaching of the Trinity is so very important. I've seen all kind of mess on Facebook the last six months about why it's not important. I got news for you. If you deny the Trinity, you're denying that Jesus Christ is God. Right. You can't go to heaven denying that Jesus Christ is God. That's right. That's right. Okay? Now listen closely. But here... As I've just said, Judas 
after hearing the truth over and over, after literally being with, what's John 14, 6 say? Jesus says, I am the way, what? The truth. After being with the truth, he still rejected. See, it's a spiritual decision. It's not about making things make sense or reasoning them together. Oh, yeah, that, that looks good. No, it's about the you know, uh, Holy Spirit God communicating right. truth to our hearts. And here we have three examples of different groups that rejected. And so now what Jude is doing, he's going into to detail about characteristics of apostates. And we start off here. In verse number 8, it says, Likewise, also these filthy dreamers, get that just a minute, defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Now we've got boom, 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 boom. So let's start off first with the dreamer part. Now I expect everybody in here knows what this is. And by the way, yes, I've been one of these too. Amen. Yes, I'm talking about the square. I'm not talking about and the other one too. We'll just get into that. Y'all know what this is? Yardstick. How long is a yardstick? How many inches is that? Okay, this is just this yardstick. If I go to yardstick and go, go slam across the country and pick up one in, a, in another store somewhere, how long is that yardstick? Every single one of them? What if you were to get a yardstick or a ruler or a measuring tape that was 36 and a 16? And you were to try to build the specifications with that yardstick or with that measurement, what would happen? Keep that in mind. Do you know that a number of times in Scripture, at least two times that I'm aware of in the Old Testament, God speaks about the, the, the authority of his word and Israel, he, God's expectation for Israel in following his word and he likens it unto a plumb line. Yes. Two different times in the Old Testament just off the top of my head. Everybody here know what a plumb line is? Yes. Everybody knows. If you were to go to the roof right here, and, and I would have Josh come up here and explain this because he could do it. It's going to take me three hours to explain it. He can do it probably 10 seconds. A plumb line gives you an exact straight line to an exact point under it. Okay, let's just stay right there. But if you take your finger and you put your finger on it, what's going to happen to that plumb line? All right. God uses that twice. He also uses a number of times in the Old Testament, he talks about the importance of the nation of Israel in their, shall we say, their obedience, his expected, of their obedience to his covenant. He commands them not to do what? Either deviate to the right side or to the left. Y'all hear what I'm saying? talking about a precise precise commands and any deviation whatsoever from God's precise from God's perfect from God's perfectly preserved as scripture tells us command is seen everybody get that? what? The reason I'm bringing that out is, is because as we start talking now about these apostates, you need to understand something. And yes, we have them all over the place today, folks. Amen. But you need to understand something. Every preacher, you hear me? that means me. Every preacher has what they, in other words, a source for truth. Now we're back to the measure tape. Every plumber, plumber. Every carpenter has a source for exact measurement. Amen? Amen. Is that right? A measure tape. 
It don't matter. You can go down here to Dollar General and get one for a dollar thirty-eight, or you can go spend forty-six dollars for for a good one up at Home Depot, and they're exactly the same. Twelve inches is twelve inches. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's twelve inches right there. Trust me. <laughs> but it has to be perfect source. So what am I getting at? False teachers have a source too. Yes. Y'all letting that sink in? See, there's only two sources. There's God, period, according to his word, with no change, no altering that core. Or, what's the other source? That's right. God tells us that you are, you have one of two fathers. Either God is your father through the blood of Jesus Christ being born again or as scripture tells us in the book of John Satan's your father. Hmm. Right. Well, people don't like that. We need to understand this before we get into this passage and start looking at who these people are. You see, you do what you do because of who you are in your heart. That's right. Y'all got that? Says likewise, these also these filthy dreamers. Now, first of all, let me say this: apostates are spiritually arrogant. Spiritually arrogant, because what they often say is is that the knowledge I have was given to me specifically, and it's private knowledge. You know, right then and there, to turn from that fellow or woman or whatever it is and run. Now. I'm just going to tell y'all, 20 years ago, if I said whatever it is, nobody would figure that out. But today, we all know. <laughs> here, the word here, the, now, let me just say this. The word filthy is not in the original. Does everybody understand that? You see it in italics in your Bible? But dreamers are. And these dreamers here in the sense, understand this. That someone that's gotten off in left field spiritually, and consider other things other than the book itself as authoritative. That's where the spiritual arrogance comes from. Amen. Spiritual arrogance. And they 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 take, they, in other words, their source for for their teaching, for the, the principles, the truth, all this stuff comes somewhere else other than scripture. Let me tell you what, 100 times out of 100, 100 out of 100 times, that individual is a false teacher. That's right. Okay? So then we start to get here into some other things, some characteristics. Now, these aren't always visible, but that's what's there. It says, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. One of the things that you see in false teachers is, okay, or not see, but it's there, and then at some points it reveals itself, you see blatant, Immorality. One, two, three. Three different big time preachers in the last two months. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Have left the pulpits because of immorality that showed up in their lives, but there was false teaching from the pulpit first. I've mentioned T.D. Jakes to y'all I don't know how many times. T.D. Jakes is a heathen. T.D. Jakes believes in modalism. This false doctrine is spreading like wildfire across this country. And yes, even into our SBC seminaries. What is modalism, you say? That means, that denies what we sang earlier, the Trinity of God. It denies that there's three in one, okay? Three distinct individuals, but still all the same. You say, well, how do you explain that? I don't know. That's just what the Bible teaches. Modalism says that God decides, okay, for right now, I'm just going to be God the Father. And I'm just going to be on the throne. But at some given point, I'm going to change. And then I'm going to be Jesus for a while. Now, listen to me. This is modalism. I'm going to be Jesus for a while, and I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to go do that. And so while I'm already there, I'll just go ahead to number two, Robert Moore from Dallas, Texas. He teaches that Jesus Christ is not God, was not God when he was here on this earth. 
Okay, so there you know. So, but that's that's spoken in later on in other times. God the Father said, "Well, for a while, I'm just going to be the Holy Spirit." Now, that's 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 nutshelling it, but that's what modalism is. All right, that went well. Defile the flesh. Listen carefully. Check my notes here. This next two words where it says despise dominion. Everything, this is the, this is the key two words to the entire book of Jude as far as it relates to apostates. You say, well, okay. Despise dominion. Again, we're back to English words that we have to pay very careful attention to okay, because that's not the, the, the literal in the Greek. Okay? But here in this sense, it means despise dominion. Hold on. As it relates to God's authority over them. Now, they will say that they speak in the name of Christ. They will say that they speak for God the Father, for God, this, that, and other, but they reject. Listen. They reject the word of God itself as being authoritative and being absolute. Did you hear what you're saying? That's another way of saying, talking about deviating from it and adding our own. Well, I believe the Bible means this, and we just take it out of context, and we add this little bit here, we add this little bit there. You've just attacked God's word, and you just attacked him personally. That's right. Listen, folks. There's a reason why that I spent four weeks in talking about spiritual discernment before we ever got to this. You, if you are saved, you come under every single day satanic attack. That's right. The problem is a lot of times is we don't realize what's going on. Amen. We don't recognize it. And sometimes it's just as simple as, shall we say, something that comes before our eyes that looks spiritual, but there's just one little bitty twist. And that's all Satan has to do. That's right. And as we spend time in the Word, listen, I'm not talking about a week. And I'm not talking about just reading a couple of verses. That's not in the Word. I'm talking about digging, reading, studying, praying over, weeping over yeah. for years. Yes. The longer you stay in, the longer you do, the easier it is to recognize. That's, that's the point of spiritual sermon. Every individual in here, regardless of the situation, every person is at different levels in spiritual maturity. We're commanded to grow spiritually. You can't grow except through, Titus tells us, except through the sincere milk of the word. I had some, I got to stop here, and I'm sorry I'm doing this, but it's on my mind, I got to say it. I was at a funeral a couple weeks ago. The people there knew my brother. Okay. My brother's not as big as I am. And so this person, for the first time they ever saw me, they looked at me, and they looked at my brother. And they looked at me, and they looked at my brother. And the guy, and I knew what was going on up there, and he said, how did this happen? I said, turnip green baby food. <laughs> That's how I've loved turnip green since I was had some last night. Don't have some more today. But you gotta have food to grow, folks. Milk's okay when you're little bitty. But it don't take long in that little bitty when you want to add some stuff to that milk, amen? I remember the first time I ever heard about adding cereal. Just, I'm not talking about Rice Krispies. I'm talking about cereal, cereal, baby stuff. I remember the first time I ever heard about adding it to milk. First, I didn't think much of it. Then I realized what it done. And I said, get me a box of that stuff. <laughs> but you know, that's the first step for a baby in the sense of after the milk in taking in more and taking in more and then you get to a point where you're giving that baby a chicken leg and you literally scared to death with whatever bite they take 
But you know what? You got to learn to eat meat as a Christian. Amen. Yeah. Take on one. Grow on. I promise you, I'm going to grow a whole lot better after 30 days of eating sirloin steaks than I am going to be 1% milk. Y'all hear me? Yeah. All right. You might better test that. Despise dominion here means rejecting the work God himself. I've told you this before. And I'll see some of these men this way. I'll be in church camp this week. I'll see some of these men, but 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 I, 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 I've, I've met with I don't know how many preachers over the last 35 years. And can I tell you, listen to me, without exception, every single preacher that gets off in left field, y'all hear me? That gets off in left field, starts leaving his church off in left field. I can always take you to one thing because usually I go to them and I talk to them about it. Every single one of them have rejected the inerrancy of Scripture. Yes. Yes. You say, but all preachers don't believe in, in, in the Scripture is inerrant. Oh, no, they don't. <coughs> I promise you that not all of the preachers in the Southern Baptist churches here in Washington Parish believe in it. Despise dominion and speak evil of dignities. Now, there's a lot here, but this is crucially important. Okay, so I'm just I'm just going I'm just going to kind of hit the, the early part of this. Speaking evil means to blaspheme. Yeah. Blaspheme dignities here means glorious, <clears throat> which means God's hierarchy. Of angelic beings. Y'all know that whenever Satan was created, his name wasn't Satan. Does everybody know that? His name was what? Lucifer. Lucifer. And the Bible tells us in the book of Ezekiel that he was top dog. Amen. He was number one of all the angels. Okay? So keep that in mind with what we're about to read here. And if you think you're number one, that means that you're not going to look favorably on anybody else. Y'all hear that? So now, we all of a sudden, as we're reading this, we get this part of the very last here about this, this dignities. And then we go immediately into a verse that we don't have a clue what's going on. Because it's mentioned nowhere else in Scripture. But, hold on to me. It's here in the canon of the scripture, which means the Holy Spirit of God gave it by inspiration, which means it's 100% true. Amen. Don't matter whether we believe it or not. That's right. Okay? Here's what it says. We learn here about something that happened after Moses' death. Verse 9 says, yet Michael, the archangel, y'all realize there's ranks of angels. Yes. Okay? Just so you know. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Stop. Now let me say something right there. In every commentary I own, which is a bunch of them, and I've thrown a bunch of them away over here, every single one of them then go into an explanation of why this happened. Well, it could have been this and it could have been that. Can I tell you that that's not important? That's right. Okay. That's not important why it happened. Okay? And probably some may be, who knows, but the bottom line is, is God didn't tell us why. But then we get to the next part that's important for the day that we live in. Y'all hear what I'm about to say? Nobody here said yes, and that's good because I hadn't said it yet. Y'all catch that? Y'all hear what I'm about to say? Thank you. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Then we have this phrase. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. We have the same type thing have taken place in the book of Zechariah. Listen closely. Michael, the archangel. By the way, we read a lot, we get to learn a lot about Michael in the book of Daniel. He is the protect protector over the nation of Israel. Y'all know that? Yes. 
all these rockets that are going into, into Israel and, and so many of them and don't hit nothing. It's, the bottom line is, is that Michael's got something to do with all that. Amen. Now, I don't have all the answers for that. I can't teach a lesson on it, but that's what the book says. Okay? He protects them physically, but he also protects them spiritually and in different ways. But here what we're talking about is that Michael, though God had sent him to get the body of Moses, he did not argue with Satan or rebuke him himself. He just said, the Lord will be you. Why am I bringing this up? Somehow this got started here among Christians over the past, I'm just going to say 20 years. I don't know how long this has been, but it's, it's, it's really growing. But every once in a while, now listen, let, let, me, let me make sure I say something. Sometimes we say things because we've heard them over and over. Yes. You know I mean? I'm not condemning anybody here, this, that, and other. But we, but we need to be careful and do things according to the word of God and say up that alone. Does everybody hear me? Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not getting on anybody. But I, I hear this quite a bit. And many times from preachers. I've heard it a lot of places. But I've heard people talk about it or as they pray, binding Satan. Y'all hear me? Yes. That's nowhere in Scripture. You, me, no man has authority to, to pronounce those words. There's only one time in Scripture where Satan is bound. How many? We find it in the book of Revelation. When God himself binds Satan and puts him into the pit for how long? 1,000 years. While Christ is ruling on this earth. That's the only time in Scripture. If it were possible for us to bind Satan, we wouldn't have to worry about stuff. He ain't been bound. He ain't going to be bound until that time. Okay? It's not scriptural to say those things. It's not scriptural for us to rebuke Satan. Michael the archangel dared not do it. We don't have that authority. Either we're going to trust God to take care of us or we're not trusting him to take care of us. God knows the things that's going on. God knows when. And again, here we go. Satan can only be in one place at a time, folks. He is not omnipresent. Now, I had literally had a woman come to me after church one time years ago, not here. And literally say these words. I don't care what the Bible says. I know what I know. She did that on three separate occasions on three different subjects. Can I tell y'all that's blasphemy? We don't have that authority to rebuke Satan. I rebuke you, I rebuke you, I rebuke you in the blood of Jesus Christ. Nowhere do you see that in Scripture. Nowhere do you see the use of that term in Scripture. Amen. Y'all hear me? So why do we think we can do that? We can't. We can't. We don't have that authority. I realize that I'm saying something right now that you've heard other people say. Some, some people are like, well, I've heard all my... Listen, we go by the book. Nothing else. The book. Well, my Aunt Effie, she always told me. I've been there too. I've had Aunt Effies that have told me this and told me that too whenever I was growing up. But most of the stuff they told me ain't in the book either. Then we see in verse number 10. It says, but these, these are their apostates, speak evil of these things which they know not. Now, quickly, and I'm about to close. It's not talking about that they don't know intellectually. Here the reference is, is to, the Bible tells us that the natural man knoweth not. They don't know it because they don't know it spiritually. Okay? It means it to you again. They're not saved, okay? Now, let me say something here. It's the very, but why is all this so crucially important? You may not realize this as much as, but you're bombarded with this stuff every single day. Right. 
You don't have to be on Facebook five minutes to start seeing these different memes that people copy and paste. And this and that. Folks, listen to me. You better make sure the things you copy and paste are doctrinally sound or you're guilty. But listen closely. It matters because the day that we live in right now, more so than any time in the modern age, certainly, Salvation itself, through the blood of Jesus Christ, by grace, through faith only, is under attack. It's under attack. It's under attack. People say, well, you don't have to quite go that far. Let me tell you something. If you don't repent of your sin, recognizing that you are a sinner, if you don't repent of your sin and ask God to forgive you of your sin, believing that Jesus Christ on that cross paid for your sin, if you don't believe those things, you're not saved. Amen. Well, I love God. Hell will be full of people that love God. Because what? They love a different God other than Scripture. Yeah. Folks, there's only one God. I'll finish with this. Listen, you're going to go, this is familiar to you, you should be. God is not who you think he is. Everybody hear me? God is who he said he is. Father, we come to you right now. God, we do live in a difficult age. But Father, you're greater. You're bigger. You're stronger. And you in the death of your son Jesus Christ and his power you empower us you enable us we are able to say greater is he that's in me than he's in the world we are able to say I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me not because of our strength of our knowledge but because of you and your power Father you know every heart here this morning you know everything. God, if there be a single person here that cannot say today, cannot say that if they die today that they know they're going to heaven. Father, your word tells us that we can know that. You tell us in the book of 1 John, you say, these things have I written unto you that ye may know. If you're here today and you don't know for sure, let me just say this. There's only one way to heaven. Only one way. We must see that we're guilty, that we're a sinner. We must believe by faith that Jesus Christ died on that cross for us to pay for that sin. He shed his blood that our sin might be washed away. But we can't do that on our own. He had to do that for us. But we have to accept what he did for us by faith. Third, we have to repent of our sins. The Holy Spirit of God will convict us and we'll, we'll know that it's wrong. We'll know, that's how we, why we come in the first place. And we want to turn away from that and get away from that and be made different. That's repentance. And God will always call upon you to forgive us of our sin. To save, be merciful and save our soul. Your word, you make a promise to us in doing that, you say whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's your desire. It's your will to save. But our sin separates us from you. Father, there are others here today, I'm certain, God, that are dealing with other things in their life. God, they need your hand there in a mighty way. Your hand of strength, your hand of power, your hand of comfort, your hand of love. God, upon them and taking care of them only dealing with such and such. Whatever it is. Father, I pray that we do what you've brought us here today to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.